My name is Owen Reskovich, the founder of The Rest Group. If you haven't already taken one of our free finance courses, um, head to the Rask Finance website where you can find loads of free valuation courses and tutorials and videos. Okay, we're going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital or the WAC for a supermarket business called Woolworths. This is the same case study that we have used in previous tutorials to do discounted cash flow analysis and some other interesting valuation models. Just a reminder, this spreadsheet is for educational and informational purposes only, so please do not rely on it. And if you have any questions, find me on Twitter at Owen Rask. Okay, so let's first ask ourselves, why do we calculate WAC? So the WAC tells us how much it costs to get funds from investors, whether they are debt or equity investors, and it is used to discount future cash flows. Going back to our discounted cash flow analysis, we forecast cash flows into the future and then we got the net present value of those cash flows um, and that's an integral part of forecasting is that in as far as discounting um, the future values back to today's dollars and when we get to it the, how we get to that discount rate is vitally important because it can have a huge impact on our final valuation okay to calculate the WAC which often seems very complicated we need to use two financial formulas or academic formulas. The first is the WAC formula itself, which I'll go through in just a moment, and the CAPM or the Capital Asset Pricing Model, which is the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by the market return minus the risk-free rate or the market premium or the expected return of the market, R subscript M. Okay, so that probably answers the theoretical part of it, but what are we actually doing? Let's imagine we have a mine or a project that we're looking to construct. Oftentimes we will need sources of funds. So we will need to go to investors and say, we're going to build this new project, this new mine. We need your money to build it. And typically we have two types of investors. We have debt investors and equity investors. Debt investors typically require interest and equity investors want dividends or to benefit from the increase in the value of that project just like shareholders and bondholders in the capital markets. Okay, so when we look at an investment, we obviously have to take into account how much it costs to get the funds to make the project. And that is exactly what we're doing with the WAC. We are taking the, 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 the value of the debt or the cost of the debt and the cost of the equity from investors and we're combining them to say, to give us an overall figure of how much it costs to to invest or the required rate of return that we would want on an investment, the minimum requ required rate of return we'd want on an investment to make it feasible. Okay, so let's just jump straight into the, the debt side of this equation. So we're just working through this top line here. To get to the cost of debt, we have to obviously take into account how much it pays uh, in terms of interest, as well as how much debt is outstanding. So the way we do that for a company is we can take the interest expense, which comes from the income statement. Uh, we just go to that now for Woolworths, which is the supermarket business we used in our case study. I went to the income statement and I found the line that said interest expense, but then it also had a note attached to it. So I went down further into the notes to the accounting statements. And here we have interest expense. So that's the first line, that's the interest expense. That's what, it, that's what Woolworths paid last year. The total debt outstanding is $3.03 billion. Now this I've taken straight from the balance sheet. That is also called the book value. When you get a finance textbook, it will say to not use the book value or the amount in the financial statements because obviously debt can change each year, but also the, the repayments on debt can also change each year. For example, if Woolworths had many different types of debt, you would have to find the yield on that debt or the interest rate uh, applicable to each individual piece of that debt and then add it all together and work out the weighted cost of that, that debt. Instead, to keep it simple, I've used the book value, taken it straight from the balance sheet. So this is debt straight from the balance sheet. You could, to make it a bit more robust, you could um, get the average of last year's value or this, this financial year, the starting value from this financial year and the ending value of the financial year. Or you could even use the target structure. So sometimes the uh, finance textbooks will say the company has a targeted 
debt capital structure of 40% and 60% equity and then you would use what you're given in the, in the textbook. In real life, it is very hard to find the market value of debt, or at least I found it very hard to find the market value of debt. So I just use the book value and make sure that there's no recent announcements um, with the company saying that it's going to take on double the amount of debt or cut its debt in half. Just so I know um, roughly what the debt's going to be, I can work out the cost of debt. Okay, the next line is simply the interest expense divided by the debt. So this is the interest rate on the debt. You could, if you know the interest rate on a piece of debt, you could jump straight to this step. So it's simply 231 divided by $3.03 billion. The tax rate in Australia is 30% for this company. So we adjust the, the interest rate on the loans and the debt because interest is typically tax deductible in most, most countries around the world, including Australia. Uh, so how do we do that? We just multiply the interest rate that we calculated up here, which is 7.62% multiplied by one minus the tax rate. Oops, and that gives us 5.34%. So what we've calculated there, this is the cost of debt after tax. That's what this is right here. The, t the market value of debt we've assumed here is $3.03 .03 billion. So all we need to get to now is the total capital, but I'll get to that in just a moment. We're going to move now into the next part of the equation, which is the cost of equity. The way we get to cost of equity is we use the CAPM or the capital asset pricing model. If you've done financial theory before, <clears throat> you'll be very familiar with the CAPM, although it may not make sense why we use it or if it's even practical in real life. One of the inputs in the capital asset pricing model, and I've written the formula out here, is the beta, which is his historical rate, um, something to do with volatility or the ups and downs of an investment relative to the market. I've written, uh, just jokingly, beta R. Uh, um, I have a few reservations about using beta, for my investing, in fact, I do not use it at all. Um, I use it sparingly perhaps in this type of calculation in the weighted average cost of capital, but even then my reliance that I, that I place upon it is very limited, partly because it is historical. But I shouldn't labor on this point, just know that this may be a very subjective or um, not very relevant going forward. So I would place little emphasis on it. So that's the beta. We can get that from, you could even get that from Google Finance, from Yahoo Finance, or from your broker, or you could go on to something like Thomson Reuters or Bloomberg, and you'll be able to find the beta for the company that you're valuing. <clears throat> the risk-free rate. This is the rate that you could invest your money for theoretically or academically, no risk at all. So long-term bonds um, are generally the, the proxy that we use here. So where do we get this from? Generally, we look at the central bank um, that we're, so the country that we're valuing, we look at the, the, the country, the company that, for the company that we're valuing, we'll look at the interest rate applicable to that country, wherever that company is located. So if we're investing in Australia, we might look at the long-term bonds for Australia. And we might say, okay, here's a screenshot from Bloomberg. The yield on Australian bonds are 2.63%. On 15-year bonds, it's 2.78%. So we could put that value in here if we wanted to. However, I've opted to use 3.5% simply because the interest rates in Australia are at historic lows. And I don't think that's very conservative to assume that the historic lows will continue forever. Therefore, I've used a 3.5% risk-free rate. If you're in the UK, you could use LIBOR, or if you're in the US or North America, you could use the federal funds rate or the treasury, the uh, yield on treasuries. The market risk premium requires us to do a bit of uh, reverse engineering. So how do you get to that? We Often we're given this in finance textbooks, but in reality, we generally have to calculate this for ourselves, and it's a very important assumption. So the market risk premium can be found by looking at the historical return of share markets <clears throat> and the total returns I'm talking about here, so dividends plus share price gains versus the risk-free rate. So I went back and looked at the ASX 200, which is Australia's leading share market index. I looked at the total return from the ASX 200 going back about 30 years. And what I found was that depending on where you are in the cycle and where you take your reference point, the Australian share market has returned between 8 and 10% per annum on average. Now, if we assume that the market is going to return 8.5% per year going into the future, 
then that means that the premium or the excess amount over what the risk-free rate is is 5%. So in other words, we're getting 3.5% from the market. We're saying the share market is going to return 8.5% into the future. So the difference between the two is 5%. So the market risk premium you can get by looking at your leading share market index, um, looking at the total return and then comparing that to the risk-free rate. So total equity for Woolworths is the market capitalization or the share price multiplied by the shares on issue. Once again, this is not book value, but it is the market value. So similar to the way we would use debt if we had it available, the market value, we use the market value of the equity in the business because obviously equity is the other part of the funding that we're using for our business. So we get a cost of equity, and this is simply the formula from the CAPM, which is 3.5%, which is the return we could get with virtually no risk, plus the beta multiplied by the market risk premium, and that's 8%. Now, a quick way that you might be able to get very close to this figure, or to use a slightly different formula, if you don't want to use the CAPM, is you could get the earnings yield or the earnings divided by share price or earnings per share divided by share price of comparable companies and average them. So I got the average earnings yield or earnings per share divided by share price of four of Woolworths' competitors and I got and I averaged them and I got 6.73%. You can see that that's a little bit lower than the cost of equity but it could be one way to get a rough rule of thumb. And what are these, so what are these things telling us? We know from up here that the 5.34% is the after-tax cost of um, the debt that we use. So that's what we need to pay debt investors essentially to get their money. They would take a 5.34% return after tax or 7.62%, sorry, I should say. They would take a 7.62% return and give us $3.03 billion. And we could use that for whatever we'd like. Looking on the other side, we have the cost of equity. And it's the same thing. We're saying, what would shareholders or share market investors, who are equity investors, be willing to accept for us to, for them, for us to get their money? And the return is 8%. So we're saying the cost of having shareholders is 8% per year, the theoretical cost. Obviously, we don't need to pay them anything each year. That's just the theoretical cost. So this is probably all starting to make sense now. We've got two, two sources of capital and we've got the amounts that, that make up the company. So that gives us total capital of $43.38 billion. As a percentage, it's almost 7% in debt and 93% in equity. So all we have to do to get to the weighted average cost is simply multiply the cost of debt after tax by the percentage of debt and then the cost of equity multiplied by the percentage of equity. For the weight, for the weighted average cost of capital, just add them up. That's as simple as you like. So the 7.81% is Woolworths' weighted average cost of capital. Now you might get a slightly different figure to me or someone else, or you might look at a broker's report and you get a slightly different value. And that's because all of these inputs are subjective. You might say that interest expense is not going to be $231 million going forward. You might say that the market value of debt is going to be more than that in the future. Remember how you said we said we could use the target structure? So therefore, we might get a different percentage here, and we might ad adjust for a different tax rate, which gives us a different cost of debt after tax. And the beta, we might say, well, that's that beta is too low or too high, and we might adjust that beta. The risk-free rate that you've assumed is too low. Let's, let's take out the cycle effects. Or the market risk premium is too rich. It's actually not going to, the share markets won't return that much going into the future. All of these inputs have an effect on the final weighted average cost of capital, which means that we're already injecting a lot of our opinion and a lot of subjectivity into the formula before we've even got to creating forecasts for cash flows or, or debt or earnings or profit or anything of that nature. So you can see why many analysts simply use a fixed rate. Oops, they might say, you know what? To hell with the whack let's just use 10% a year, or let's assume that we need at least a 12% weighted average cost of capital to pursue an investment. Okay, I hope you didn't get through that, tr that tutorial and then think, oh, 
it's all worthless. This is an important part in financial theory and understanding it is crucial because you need to understand and scrutinize other investors' valuations. And if they're assuming too high of a weighted average cost of capital, then they might be overly conservative. If it's too low, then they may be a bit too bullish. For example, let's assume that this discount rate was 5%. You can see what happens to the valuation of Woolworth shares here. Look at that, it more than doubles. Even though we've only dropped the weighted average cost of capital from 7.75% to 5%, which is say a 50%, a 30% decline, the valuation grows more than 250%. Conversely, if we go the other way and we say we have a 10% discount rate, the valuation doesn't quite cut in half, but it falls substantially. So you can see that the final discount rate you use has a huge impact on valuation. If you have any questions on the weighted average cost of capital, remember you can email, you can find me on Twitter at Owen Rask, or you can head to our website, raskfinance.com, and you can ask us, ask us a question. I hope this tutorial helped you, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers to our financial futures.